Today is Thursday, August 20th, 2020. My name is Jorge Cruz. I'm interviewing Luis Valencia for Labor Studies Voices of a Pandemic Story Collection Project. This is a collaborative, a collaborative project between UCLA um, and Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, please know, Mr. Valencia, that this interview will be placed on the Digital Public Library of America and shared with Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, um, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you would like to discuss, please make sure to bring it up and we'll talk about it. Um, because we're not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting to be interviewed. So I'll ask you a series of six questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each one. UCLA Labor Studies wishes to archive your interview, along with any other photographs and other documentation on the, on the Digital Public Library of America. UCLA Labor Studies will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to UCLA Labor Studies. Um, so the first question, do you give UCLA Labor Studies consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Digital Public Library, Library of America? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you grant UCLA Labor Studies right, title, and interest in copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes. Okay. Do you agree to allow UCLA Labor Studies and the Digital Public Library of America to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes. Okay. Do you grant UCLA Labor Studies consent to share your interview and your materials with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the Voices of, Pan of a Pandemic Oral History mini project, which will include posting the interview on the internet. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, and I sh I'm just gonna read this little paragraph before I ask you the last two questions. Um, so we have many questions in an online pre-interview form that we have already filled out. Um, we use that information from the pre-interview form to help future research on this topic. The entire form is kept in a secure Voices server at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, before Voces sends it to the Benson Library and NIU libraries, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members. So that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library and NIU libraries. So question five, do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview and your public file available to researchers at the Benson Library? Yes. Okay, and the last question. On occasion, the UCLA Labor Studies and Voices receive requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. Um, we only deal with legitimate news outlets. Um, so do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so that's it for the preamble. So we can get started with the, the interview. Um, so just first things first. Um, the first question I have, just to kind of start the interview, is um, talk to me about some uh, about one thing that brings you joy right now. Um, oh, <laughs> sorry, I thought I was prepared, but um, one thing that brings me joy right now, um, I guess, is uh, keeping creative and getting the ball rolling with like my artwork. Um, that's something that's been. Uh, a constant right now. So I think that that would be one of the things that, that brings me joy. Mm, okay. Um, and so how do you, uh, sorry, um, how do you identify? Do you identify as Latino, Latinx, Hispanic, Chicano, or any other term? Uh, Latino or Latinx. I'm pretty open to that. Yeah. All right. And uh, where are you from originally? And where do you live now? Um, so originally from LA, uh, but Grew up in the Inland Empire, like San Bernardino, Fontana area, uh, but I live in Los Angeles. Okay. All right. And so tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, what is it that you do? Um, and just, yeah, just to kind of introduce yourself to, to, to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Um, so I am a Latinx uh, queer person. Uh, I'm an artist. Uh, I paint, uh, oil paint, um, and I'm a text artist as well. And that's like uh, where my income mostly comes from. Yeah, tattooing. Yeah. How, how long have you been a tattoo artist for? 
I actually just hit my two year mark. Um, yeah, this month. So so I've been doing it for two years now. So I'm still I'm still a tattoo baby. <laughs> yeah and um and you did um you studied art at uh, ucla right yeah 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 yeah. i studied art at fine art at ucla um i graduated 2018 okay. yeah, six years ago okay yeah. um so um walk me through a day in your life before COVID 19 like how did that how did you like uh, how was it like to go to work or like what did you do before the pandemic hit um, so before the pandemic, uh, I was pretty busy at work. Um, I had a constant flow of clients, so I would go in in the morning um, and, you know, do a handful of tattoos and then come back home. Like, depending on the, the size, I could either come back home, like, in the afternoon or, like, 8 o'clock at night. Uh, and then I would prepare designs for the next day. So it was just, like, a constant, like, work, 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 work. And then... Um, yeah, I was working a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that regarding like the, the work, um, how, how is the like post COVID? Did you see like kind of a drop in your clients and a drop in your work? Like, how, how did that? Um, I guess, uh, how, how were you affected in that sense? So before COVID hit, um, I, I was pretty booked up. And then as it was hitting around and like we had cases in like the Bay Area or just like surrounding areas, um, people weren't really worried about it. Um, but then we, like the owner of the shop decided to close up uh, just for everyone's safety. Um, and I just like, I haven't been tattooing since like March 18th, I believe. Uh, so it's been a handful of months. And um, people, it's interesting though, because people still DM me through Instagram or like email me and they're like, oh, are you like, are you tattooing under the table? Or like, are you doing it at home? Like, I, I still want to get tattooed. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really interesting, but I just, I, I can't, you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, it stopped completely. Okay. And that hasn't um, picked back up, right? It's still, as of now, still closed? We were able to open for a couple of weeks, I believe, um, last month or so, um, but we, we didn't. Um, so yeah, we're, we're still closed. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, um, but I, I want to ask you first, um, so how did you first learn about COVID-19? Was it through an uh, employer, through your friends, family, or through the media? Uh, it was through the media. I, like every morning, I like have my coffee and like read my articles. Um, so I, I read about it uh, through just like some internet article and yeah. And what were your... Um, like, what, were your, what was your initial reaction? Like, what were your first thoughts when you first learned about COVID-19? Um, I didn't think too much of it because there's been other, like, viruses uh, that have been going around. Like, growing up, it was, like, uh, the, uh, what is it, the swine flu and mad cow disease and, like, things like that. Um, nothing, it, they never really affected me growing up, so I didn't think much of it. I thought it was just going to, like, blow over. It was going to affect a couple of people, and so, yeah, I didn't think it was a big deal at the time. Okay. And has that, like, shifted as the months went on? Like, where was it when you started taking it, like, seriously and seeing that it was, like, bigger than the swine flu and bigger than those, those previous diseases or viruses? So... I still didn't think it was a big deal even when we closed up. I thought we we're gonna close up for a couple of weeks, you know, it was all gonna blow over. Um, but as time went on, I was like, this is really serious. This is like affecting so many people. So many people are dying um, from it. So I, I, yeah, slowly but surely, I realized the magnitude of it. Mm -hmm. And you also said that part of your family is in Georgia, right? Like how did they first react to it and, and like, how has it been for them with dealing with the pandemic as well? Um, to them, I don't think it's as big of a deal because Georgia is one of those states that didn't really close up and didn't enforce any like masks or have any mask mandates or like uh, enforce any social distancing. Um, they were never really out of work. Um, so to them, like life was on like normal, like like I was telling you before we started recording, um, my sister's in school now, they're like going to classes. Um, so with my eight year old sister, um, everyone's been working, doing their thing, hanging out. Um, 
you like I visited my family and I would go to stores with with them and I would be the only one wearing my mask because in LA like you have to wear a mask before going into the store over there it's like just optional so no one does it so yeah it's like night and day really really and and what like talking to your family members how do they view the virus or, or the pandemic do, do they take it are they taking it seriously or are they also just kind of um no. I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so at all. Like, mm-hmm. um, my little sister it was her birthday during the time that I visited, and my mom had a, a birthday party for her. So there was a bunch of little kids running around and their parents. Um, so I don't, I don't think they've taken it seriously at all. Um, I tell them about my experiences here in LA and how serious it is, and like all the cases that we have, and like, like I said, like we have to wear a mask before going into any store, and we have to have hand sanitizer all the time. Um, mm. And they think that's pretty extreme. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, on that topic, like can you describe a little bit more like your employer, like how long have you worked for them? You, you mentioned two years, but mm-hmm. like, what is it like a small, like mom and pop tattoo shop? Like what kind of, um, what kind of employer do you have? So uh, it's a queer woman owned business. Um, I've been there, the shop has been there for about three years now, and I've been there for two. Um, started right after I graduated. Um, and yeah, I went through my apprenticeship, uh, for like three, four months, and then I started working. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and so can you describe your job and, and your job responsibilities? Like you said that, like, kind of like you do designs and you also do tattooing. Um, so what what are what are your job responsibilities? So there, um, I what do I do? <laughs> I pretty, <laughs> um, I just honestly all I do is just um, if I have a client, uh, they email me what they want to get tattooed on them, and um, if I have any questions about it, like size, uh, where they want it on their body, if they want to use any color, like little things like that, just to get me prepared to for the design um, i design it do a couple of options or changes um the day of the tattoo uh, they come in and if they want anything changed i can do that but uh, pretty much get to it and i tattoo them and then clean up and then it's the next person so it's pretty like yeah it's pretty simple and straightforward mm-hmm. and you said you kind of you work uh as an independent contractor right so it's a, there's a lot of autonomy in your work as well yeah um my the owner is always um empowering us and telling us like this is your business like yeah we are working in the shop but uh it's really our business so i can do whatever i want um i can have my own hours um i can go in there at like two o'clock in the morning if i wanted to and tattoo um i can have my own days off um yeah and so we kind of discussed this a little bit on how covid impacted your work right so you mentioned that the the shop closed um so how have you been um i guess supplementing your income now that like the shop has been closed for about what more than five months now um what have you been doing as alternatives to um for for work and to 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 make money so at first it was really scary because um being an independent contractor we weren't able to receive any uh, unemployment benefits for the first two months. So I was really freaking out. Um, I started uh, designing just a bunch of like flash tattoos or designs and then I would have people um, send deposits, um, a certain amount of, of money so they can hold on to that design. So when we were able to open, they would get that tattoo. So I would use that to like, you know, buy food or like pay certain bills. Um, and then I started kind of shifting or thinking about ways that I can like shift my work since I'm not able to tattoo how can I like translate that into other artwork so I started uh screen printing my designs on t-shirts um and then now I'm doing some embroidery projects and yeah like that has been picking up so so that has been um pretty helpful financially yeah do you think even when the shop reopens you're going to continue this type of work with the screen printing embroidery do you think that's something that you see yourself doing long term now um the thing is like i've had these ideas before covid was a thing um but since i was pretty busy i never had time to actually do it um 
it, it's I'm kind of lucky that this is happening and like I'm able to like focus on this body of work mm -hmm. um but I think I will be taking some time to kind of like keep it going so it can be something that's hand in hand and I can like expand this artwork not to just like one thing so that in, in a way that could be seen as a, as a positive right that you're able to have more time to focus on these interests that you kind of didn't have time for before right yeah yeah for sure yeah yeah definitely um and so and also you mentioned that um during the first two months you did not qualify for unemployment so did you have any savings that kept like kept you going for those uh, first two months yeah, so being an independent contractor, um, I knew that at the end of the year, I would have to pay, or like uh, during tax season, I would have to pay something. Um, and I, I've never been an independent contractor. I've always uh, worked uh, as a W-2, like through uh, retail or like whatever, uh, what have you. Um, so I did save some money uh, and I kind of, I used some of that. So I was okay in the beginning. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and you had mentioned, oh, well, I was going to ask like how your job responsibilities have changed, but you've kind of like, given that the shop has closed, you've done all this other work. So, <laughs> um, so, so now that we're like fully in this pandemic, how does your work day look like now? My work day? Yeah. Like what, when you wake up, like, what is it that you do? Like, like with with these other projects that you're doing now like what does that day-to-day -day look like now um now it's a it's a bit more slowed down i guess um so i, I kind of like take my time uh like with with screen screen printing um it was a huge learning curve and i didn't know anyone that like knew how to do it so it was like i was just watching a bunch of youtube videos all day ordering my supplies and then kind of like you know, figuring it out by myself. Um, there was a lot of messed up shirts in the beginning. Um, so I took the whole day just like messing around with it. Um, and then, uh, I mean, most of the day I would either design or like, I don't know, it was, it was very laid back. It was just like uh, working at my own pace um, and making sure, I, I don't know, I just like kept going, I guess, yeah. Um. And so now, do you find yourself to be um, more financially stable? Um, now that I'm getting unemployment, um, I think I'm okay. Uh, I'm not in need, luckily. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say financially stable just because I've been deferring a lot of like my bills, like my car payment, um, my student loan, um, things like that. If I were to be paying for those right now, I don't think I'd be stable at all. And are those payments, um, have they been waived or have they just been delayed that you still have to repay them? So my car payment, um, I've been delaying it every two months. Um, but I don't know how, how many times I'm able to do that. Mm. And then for my student loan, it was uh, deferred until September. I don't know if they're going to um, kind of lift that and make you pay again. Hopefully not, but if they do, I'm going to have to start paying that, yeah. Okay. Um, and also, um, regarding, like, healthcare, um, given that we're going through a pandemic, did you have health insurance before, and do you have health insurance now? I have um, Medicaid, Medi-Cal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have that, um, which isn't the best, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I had it uh, before the pandemic and still have it now, yeah. So um, have you got, have you yourself gotten tested for COVID? Yeah, I did um, a couple of months ago, uh, just because my boyfriend's uh, mom was in hospice and we wanted to stay with her and help her out. Um, so we had to get tested um, and then, yeah. Okay, so you, you've, you kind of like regularly get tested just, just for the safety of those around you? We, yes, so she was like super susceptible to like anything right so you had to be uh super healthy to be around her she, since she had cancer um mm. uh yeah so we got tested and we stayed up there she they live in the middle of nowhere in the desert mm -hmm. uh 30 minutes away from temecula so we weren't around people it was just the family and we stayed there for like two months mm. um so we yeah we didn't really have any like risks mm. 
Okay. Do you know anyone like within your immediate family or, or social circle who has actually um, had COVID? No, I don't actually. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, and what about um, like any type of mental health uh, challenges? Um, have you been like uh, experiencing any of those during the pandemic? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, I have a history of depression. Mm -hmm. um, I've taken like Zoloft and like, what have you. Um, so at the beginning of this, I was like freaking out. Uh, so yeah, I did. I was pretty depressed at first. Um, and yeah, it was, a, it was a roller coaster for sure. Uh, luckily, I was in a better place to, to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I, I was a little better off. But it was still, yeah, still there. And how have you been coping with that? Was it through like the support of your friends and family or have you like taken on other like maybe like doing meditations or yoga to like help you cope? Um, I have not meditated, <laughs> even though it's like highly recommended. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't done that. Uh, what I was doing, I've been working out um, just like every single day mm -hmm. uh, working out because it, it's something that I can control. I mm -hmm. guess and it just releases those endorphins and dopamine mm -hmm. and whatever um so that's the only way and then just keeping keeping active and creative too that's been uh very therapeutic okay and so have you you've been working out from home yeah just watching videos <laughs> oh really <laughs> okay yeah because yeah. i was asking if you like created your own little home gym or anything yeah, yeah yeah i have some weights upstairs um and this yoga mat and like I've been watching videos and I'm sure my neighbors like hate me just from like all the stomping and like running around. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and so, okay. So, so how, I mean, we, we talked about how like COVID has impacted you personally and also like those around you. Um, so has it changed the way that you interact too? Like, have you been like, uh, making less frequent visits to like the grocery store, less frequent visits to like with families and friends? Like how has it changed the way you interact with other people and yeah. So at first, uh, the first few months, um, we would go to the grocery store like maybe once a week, week and a half and like just bulk by mm -hmm. um, and try to not go out at all. Um, we stopped seeing friends, we stopped seeing anyone, so we were really just like locked in. Uh, it felt like a prison, to be honest. Um, but now, and we were like super, super um, anal about like cleaning our groceries and washing our hands all the time um, and sanitizing everything. And now I, I go to the grocery store more often, uh, just so I won't have to buy so much at a time. Um, and, but I'm still careful. Um, and I still haven't, we still don't see people though, just mm -hmm. to keep everyone else, you know, safe. Yeah. So, um, kind of to look also like at the, the broader picture with, I mean, we are going through a pandemic, but at the same time, we're going through a lot of like social upheavals. Uh, we're going through an election that's going to happen in a couple of months. So how do you see all of that kind of playing out? Like, where do you see the state of things? Like the, the, the direction that things are going, how it's being handled? um it's i that's a huge question um i i don't know to be honest um during uh the black lives matter movement um we were at my boyfriend's uh family's place because his mom was on hospice um so i wasn't able to go to any protests just to keep them safe um and there was a lot going on uh, with social media and like the media in general. And there was like a huge amount of like information and just like coverage. And like, I felt like I didn't really get to experience the whirlwind that was going on, but I kind of like felt it through, through the media. Um, and I tried to disseminate or like just share a bunch of like information as much as I could. Um, so that was like really intense. And then just like the election, voter suppression, just like people not being able to like pay for, for uh, rent or bills or just like the pandemic. There, it's just like a lot, a lot. And it's just pretty intense. Uh, the direction, I hope it's going to go in, in a good direction. Um, sadly, Bernie is not in the running anymore <laughs> to like help us out. Um, but hopefully um, 
Trump is like voted out of office and we can like, you know, um, hold Biden, Harris to like, a, you know, a higher standard and hopefully change happens. Mm -hmm. So do you plan on voting from, through mail-in ballot? Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Have you had any trouble receiving your mail-in ballot or anything? I requested it um, a couple of weeks ago. I haven't received anything. Um, so I don't know, I've been hearing a lot about like uh, people taking like mailboxes away and like uh, the mail being slowed down. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really scary. Hopefully it does come in time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't know if I, if I do have to go to a polling place like Saudi, I'm just gonna do it. Mm, okay. Um, so um, we had talked about, oh, so you said you weren't able to participate in any protest. Um, but uh, so do you have any worries regarding like you or your family members? Um, like, for instance, are any of your family members like undocumented? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how have they been dealing with it? Like, have you like, um, like the stress of being undocumented and having to deal with like a pandemic? Um, so my aunt, she is undocumented. Um, luckily my mom is now, she has uh, her papers. Uh, so I don't worry about her as much anymore. Um, but with my aunt, she's undocumented. undocumented. Uh, she's here in LA and she, she believes, like she doesn't have her driver's license right now. And um, she doesn't want to be in some sort of system, you know, to like get it. And like, it's, it's kind of like, that balancing act of like um it's beneficial for her but then she's also worried about getting like you know deported um so it, it's really difficult um and she's in a situation as well where like her landlords want to kick her out so like her having to find a new place um and like her husband not being able to work she's not able to work be because she doesn't have the right documentation like it's a really tricky time like it just like through them out there and like they kind of don't have anything to hold on to um so we've been helping them out as much as we could and like especially with like information or just like financially um but yeah she she was in a tricky tricky boat do you think this um pandemic has also kind of brought you closer to your family in, in that way to kind of like support one another um through this yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think so. I think there's a lot more communication and like we call each other like every day, every other day, see how we're doing, um, any updates. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it's brought us, brought us closer a lot more than before because we were just kind of like, you know, in our own lane, like living our life with work and like being super busy. So it kind of like slowed things down for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about um, also like those immediately around, like what about have you kind of reached out to your neighbors as well? No. <laughs> no, I'm trying to stay away from people. <laughs> no, um, I have uh, not my neighbors. Uh, they're a little bit older, so <laughs> we don't have a lot in common. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think I've made more connections with people uh, online, like with Instagram or social media. I've like reached out and like have made new online friends. Um, yeah. So that's good. I mean, tell me a little bit more about that. Like, so now that you're not able to make connections physically, so you've kind of transitioned to more making new connections online. How has that been? Like, how do you feel like social media plays a role um, to like create th those spaces to build those virtual relationships? Um, how, like, how do you see that? It's interesting because I feel like I'm more of a, I'm, I'm a social person, um, but I like being in front of someone and like reading body language and like engaging with them um, and going out to get a coffee or like some food and I'm not able to do that and then just like having um, building or trying to build a connection over the phone is, is really hard I think and I feel like you read certain texts a certain way when they probably come across a different way so there's that sort of barrier um, and then you you don't get that like physical connection as much so it's a little bit more difficult um to engage with someone but um it's the best that we can do right now yeah do you feel also that social media gives you that um 
that outlet and that space to still feel connected with the outside world, to keep up with like current events, to keep up with like other people's, what they're doing, how they're coping. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I'm on my phone every day, all the time. So, and I'm getting like this huge influx of information. Um, sometimes it's pretty overwhelming just how much is going on. Um, but I, I like knowing that things are still going on in the world and like I, I have some sort of like connection or grasp of it somehow. Mm. Okay, yeah. and so, um, I mean, now that we're like five months into like the pandemic, do you feel like this, um, like certain habits have changed, certain like certain even goals, like life goals have, have changed, have shifted because of this? Um, yeah, <laughs> um, I guess, um, my, I regret not being, like, my goal for 2020 was to, was to guest spot, which is, as a tattoo artist, you would go travel to, like, let's say New York or, like, out of the country and, um, work at a shop for a couple of days and do your work and, like, you get to explore the city and travel, um, so I wanted to do that, um, and I regret that I'm not able to do it, but I think that um, once this is all over, I think I'm gonna go ahead and do that and kind of like really take control of like my career and what I'm able to do. And if you know, I'm privileged enough to, to travel, then I'm gonna go do that, and yeah. So there's a lot of like, um, kind of like a, also a sense of like, like, like to stop putting stuff off, right? To do it now because the future now is a little bit uncertain, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel like it, it, this was always like either on the back burner. Yeah, I'll do that. But we were so like, you know, um, just super hyper focused on like the day to day and like work or whatever mm -hmm. that you kind of like forget about these things. Um, mm -hmm. But it's definitely put it into perspective. Mm -hmm. And also, like you had mentioned that, I mean, you identify as Latino, Latinx, you also identify as queer. And so how do you see that this has um, specifically impacted those, those communities that you're a part of, right? The Latino community that we've seen has been disproportionately affected by this pandemic, right? Because we disproportionately represent, uh, represent like the essential work industries. And also, um, how has it impacted like your, like the queer community as well that, that, you've, that you've seen? Yeah, it's insane. Just like uh, reading about this or just like knowing um, some people that are in the in the front lines, I guess, of working like either farm workers or just like people that work in warehouses. Like growing up, um, my mom and just like family members were always in warehouses. So I know a lot of people in that field and um, they're just like crammed into small spaces or um, having to work because without that, they're not able to pay for rent and like a lot of these people are undocumented so they don't believe that they have the same rights as someone that is documented so they're like greatly affected and they feel like they have to go to work because if they get sick or anything I mean how are they going to pay for like a medical bill how are they going to pay for rent how are they going to pay for this or that um, and they're also not getting uh, unemployment help or any financial assistance from the government um, because they're not documented. So it's like, it's really insane. And it's kind of, it's really sad and tragic that they're put into this position. And I mean, I don't think much is being done from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, so <clears throat> the last question I have just to kind of conclude is, um, so is there anything else you would like to share with me about your experiences with COVID that, that I haven't asked about yet? Um, no, but I hope it's over soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, I don't, I don't know what to, sh what else to share. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just, uh, like, like that you're hopeful, right? So you're hopeful for, for the future, for what's to come, like, I mean, that's good. Like, that's some, and then you said you hope, like, to, to, you know, to get back to work and to also, like, go back and see your friends and family, right? Like, yeah, yeah, I guess um, I am very hopeful and, like, um, that now that we've kind of slowed down a little bit as a society, we're able to, like, sit back and, and think about things that are going on, what's actually really important. 
and how to treat others and like how to help others, um, whether it be undocumented or queer or trans um, or within the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, just like so much reform um, changes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's like, even despite being like physically isolated, we're still form part of this like greater community and just kind of showed the, the, the importance of community, right? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, all right, well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for taking the time to you know, tell us about your story and to, um, to share with us um, your life and everything. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you for letting me be a part of this. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to end the recording.